All right, good morning, everyone. Let's open with a word of prayer today. Our Father, we're so thankful today for what we know you have accomplished in Jesus Christ, that you gave your Son into this world. You sent him into this world to, to die for us to hang on a cross, to bleed, to die, to be buried, to be raised again the third day according to the scriptures. And our thanksgiving and our gratitude for that is an extremely feeble expression. And to find the words that could adequ adequately convey that are difficult to find. But the best we can do is say, thank you. Thank you for what you have done for us and I'm thankful for all these that join us by way of internet YouTube and Facebook and I pray that today as we look into this subject of recognizing each other in eternity that our hearts will be open and attentive to what the Bible has to say and that we would refrain from our own philosophies our own opinions and just say what say and just speak what saith the scripture i pray these things today in that name that is above every name the name of our lord and our savior jesus christ amen so one moment folks just one moment okay All right, the subject of recognizing our loved ones in heaven, in eternity, or not, is, to say the least, at least to me, a strange doctrine. It never occurred to me that anyone would arrive at that conclusion. So, you know, when I heard it for the first time, recently I heard it, I was shocked and then you know questions concerning this flooded my brain and to be honest in disbelief so I've shared before that when I was four years old my father was taken from me in, in a freak paper mill accident he was a millwright and was walking past this gigantic tank and the, the door was opened and he saw a man lying on the floor and he went in there to help him to find out you know what was going on but unfortunately my father died also that instant a little later another man walking by the same tank saw both of them lying on the floor and he didn't go in he called for help and we later learned that both of them had been gassed to death and uh, that's the day that I was in front of our house and I was playing with my Tonka truck Tonka trucks and I was waiting for my my dad to come home and a boy from the neighborhood who had just delivered his father's lunch to the mill was returning home and as he passed by he said to me did you know your father was dead and you know he was only one year older than me so I'm sure he didn't realize the permanent implications of what he was saying so I remember running upstairs and I repeated that to my mother and said mom did you know dad was dead and she assured me that he'd be home in a few moments and rather than his arrival my father's two brothers came to see us and they you know they substantiated that yeah in fact they had been gassed to death and when i realized the gravity of that situation i remember i remember being under the kitchen table holding on to the legs of the kitchen table crying and saying i want my dad because i realized now what that meant i realized I realized the permanent implications of this and a few days later 
And this is why I'm sharing this with you. You know, we were at the funeral and I asked my mother for a penny. And I went up to the open casket and I put the penny on his hands and I said, Dad, buy yourself something when, when you get to heaven. Now, no one taught me about heaven or hell. I was, I was only four years old. Obviously, I had not gone to any catechism classes yet. But intuitively, I knew about heaven. You know, no one, and no one suggested that I go put money on his hand. I mean, it was just a spontaneous thing that came from my innermost being as a fact that would take place. And that fact is that one day I would be reunited with my father. And that was an idea that I never challenged. And I never thought that it would be challenged until I heard someone recently say that we will not recognize our loved ones in heaven. And then there was talk of a memory wipe. Everything and everyone that you've ever known will be erased from your brain. And, you know, like I said, it's not something that I ever thought I would hear. But there it was. And, uh, you know, one of the verses that he shared, that he used that day was Ecclesiastes 9.5. It says, For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything, neither have they any more a reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. So, how do we explain this verse? Or is the, me like, for the memory of them is forgotten. He said that that means that they don't remember anything. Like their memory is gone. Like they had a memory wipe. So, folks, let me help you understand the words, the memory of them is forgotten. Now, most of you will be able to relate to this. You know, in humanity, in our lives, time moves in one direction and memory, memories move in the other direction. You know, the older we get, the further back our memories go. You know, sometimes our memories are all that we have. And they're priceless. Many of our memories are happy memories. Some are sad memories. And uh, I try not to dwell on any sad memories. I, I, I just don't want to go there, right? But, you know, I know that in my case, I only want to remember the good things and the good times, okay? I have forgiven and forgotten the bad memories that I've had in my past. So time moves in one direction and our memories move in the other direction. For example, we grew up going to our grandparents' house and on the walls of their houses were pictures, lots of pictures, right? Pictures of their father and their mother, and even pictures of their grandfathers, and their grandmothers, and their brothers, and sisters, and some of their cousins, even pictures of our parents while they were growing up. And, you know, we would ask about these people that we didn't know. And we'd say, you know, who's this one, and who's that one? And they'd say in French, well, that was, ça, ça vient de les Chouinards. Puis lui, il vient de les Lévesque, and, he, you know, she married him, and he married her, and then those are some of your cousins, and there's your second cousins over there, and, and, and you know, we looked at all these pictures, and we knew we came from somewhere. Like, here's the evidence. 
But then, as we were growing up in our own houses, you know, we had pictures of our grandparents and, of course, of our parents and all of us kids, right? But then we had our own houses. And where are the pictures of our grandparents' parents and their parents and all their cousins? Well, those pictures are not with us anymore. Those people literally are now forgotten. The memory of them is forgotten. That's what this verse is referring to. This verse has nothing to do with a memory wipe at all. At all. It's about your, you know, and this, what I'm talking about is true in every family in the world. Whether you live in India or Germany or the UK or Canada or the United States, you have all experienced what I'm speaking of at this moment, right? You, you don't no longer know your, your grandparents' parents and their children and all that. You, you no longer know them. The memory of them is forgotten. Now, you look at this verse in Proverbs 10, 7. The memory of the just is blessed, but the name of the wicked shall rot. Now, the memory of the just is blessed does not mean that a just man, an honest man, has a better memory to memorize or remember things than the memory of a wicked man. The memory of the, of the just, or the memory of the just is blessed, is like my grandfather and my grandmother were both totally just and honest and upright and people of integrity beyond measure. When I remember, and love, and kindness, okay? And when I remember them, or I think of them, I want to tear up. Because the memory of them, to think of, of them in remembrance, is a blessing. It's a real blessing. But suppose you had an uncle who was a murderer, or a rapist, right? His memory will rot. When people think about him, it doesn't bring tears to their eyes. They just want to forget him, right? That's what it means that it, the name of the wicked will rot, okay? When you think about him and you're like, ugh, you know, get, get him out of my life, okay? So the teaching of memory in the Bible is not of a total memory wipe. On the contrary, it means that we will remember. And let me show you two other verses that he used. And these verses that I'm going to show you apply to the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. The millennial reign, okay? Isaiah chapter 65, verses 16 and 17. That he who blesseth himself in the earth shall bless himself in the God of truth. And he that sweareth in the earth shall swear by the God of truth. Because the former troubles are forgotten. And because they are hid from my night. Now notice the former troubles are forgotten. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. And the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. Now, this guy was saying that there's a memory wipe here also. But notice what the Bible says in verse 16, right? The former troubles are forgotten. The former troubles. Not everyone you ever knew. Then in verse 17, 
you know, if, uh, this is speaking about the new heavens and the new earth, but if you remember, a few weeks ago, I preached a message, a message titled, uh, The Three Worlds of Scripture. And we talked about the heavens representing governmental authority. And during this age that we live in, it was the wrong government authority that's operating in this world, which is the prince and power of the air. And we talked about the earth and its governmental thing right now. And that will be replaced by a government wherein dwelleth righteousness. Okay. Now, in that new system of government, uh, governance, what won't be remembered? Well, the former government. Verse 17 is talking about the government. You, we need to understand, okay? And I tried to make this clear in that message, but I, I think many people, you know, you don't get everything that, that I say in one message, but... God is not going to create a new solar system, a new firmament, and a new earth. The earth that you and I live on is a living, throbbing earth, okay? In this earth, there is so much life that it is incredible. It doesn't need to be recreated. It just needs to be cleansed of the people who are destroying it. And that's going to happen when the new government of Jesus Christ takes over this earth. All this climate control and things that are being manufactured by men that create destruction all that is going to go away. You realize that if they stopped, HAARP, H-A-A-R-P, if they stopped the weather controlling that they're doing now, within a year, if they stopped everything that they're doing, within a year, this earth would be replenished, restored, regenerated, rejuvenated, back to its normal, there wouldn't be all these crazy things and weather things that are happening that are created by you know who. Okay, that, that, that would not be happening. So there's no need to create a new earth. This earth is perfect. Okay, if man had never been placed on this earth and only the animals were here, this would be the most beautiful, perfect place because they belong here. The only animal that doesn't belong on this planet is the one that's ruining it. You understand? That's a fact of life, okay? So, you know, you know like, you know, <laughs> I don't want to go too far into this, but, you know, they say the ozone is depleted and therefore... Rays are coming from the sun in a brighter, you know, more powerful way because the ozone is depleted. Folks, let me tell you, the ozone is 21 miles up. 21 miles. That's where the ozone is. And, you know, when you fly into any major city, whether it's Dallas or um, Chicago or New York City, as you're flying in and you're like several miles away and you see the city, you see a cloud hovering over that city you see like like a fog but it's not fog it's it's pollution right but you see it but you also maybe maybe you never notice it but it's not rising it's not rising it's hovering because the atmospheric pressure that is in our atmosphere keeps it from rising so there's nothing from this earth that is rising 21 miles into the air affecting the ozone layer. There's nothing doing that, okay? The whole thing is a sham. So I don't want to go too far into this, okay? But we don't need a new heaven and we don't need a new earth. This earth is perfect just the way it is. 
and when it's taken over by the owner of this earth, everything is going to be beautiful, brother. Everything is going to be great, sister. <laughs> Amen. So, but the fact of the matter is, these verses have nothing to do with a memory, memory wipe. They just don't have anything to do with that. And please don't forget, these verses are written to Israel. They're not written to you and me. You know, like, here we are. We're living in 2024, right? We are part of a long history of humanity. You know, many things have come before us. Many things that have come before us can't even be explained. They understood thing, things in those ancient civilizations that we don't understand today. To have built the things that they built. The things that are on earth now, gigantic round, like the size of, of this house, right? Gigantic polished granite stones. Polished, right? And, you know, the pyramids and cities and architectural buildings that we can't even build today and you know grant you know like granite caves that are you know all decorated and 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 all polished how did they do that well we don't know so many things have come before us and it's possible that many things are yet to happen in the future that we'll know nothing about okay so when you're a believer, there are some things that you take for granted simply because it's just the inevitable conclusion one arrives at from understanding the Bible and from knowing God himself, right? I mean, I think about Job chapter, gee, I haven't thought of this verse in a long time. I believe it's Job 22, 22, if I'm not mistaken, but. I could be wrong, it could be Job 20, 22, but acquaint now thyself with him and be at peace. Acquaint now thyself with God and be at peace. You know, that's, that's like the key to life. The key to life to be at, is to be at peace and not let this world take your peace from you. I was talking to someone the other night, I said, man, stay away from the news. Stay away from that stupid thing all the information that everybody's putting out there, all of it is designed to make money. Is some of it true? Some of it may be true, but I know there's a lot of, there's a lot of sensationalizing going on in our world and in the news today, okay? And you got to be careful with that. But the worst thing about that is that it takes your peace. Some of you are worried about things that aren't, don't even affect you, won't even affect you in this life, won't even affect you. Okay, so I know how, th how bad things look. I, do, I know the whole thing, okay? I know all about the illegal, you know, in invasion. I know, all about, I know all about that. But there's nothing you're going to do about it. There's nothing I'm going to do about it. You know, people talk about it like, you need to wake up. No, we're all awake. You know, people say, you need to wake up, folks. Look what's, we are awake. But what, what is that person who says you need to wake up doing about it? What is he doing about it? What is she doing about it? Absolutely nothing except yapping and yapping forever about what's wrong. We all know what's wrong. But what can we do about it in face of, a, of, of this polluted world that we live in, okay? So, when I think of this life that we're all part of, that we all experience in one way or another, I understand that, you know, we all have different backgrounds and we all have different friends that we grew up with and, you know, different family and different groups that we belong to. And, you know, hopefully we all had families. Some people don't have that privilege. They've been given up on or, you know, they grew up in dysfunctional homes. But, you know, the majority of the population, we, we, you know, we have families. But we've all had different teachers. We've all had different educations. We all had co-workers with different beliefs and everything. And, of course, then there's 
religion. Religion. I would say religion is the greatest enemy, right? Over 45,000 de denominations just in Christendom, just, just designed to confuse the living daylights out of you, right? But we've all read, you know, different books and watched tapes and movies and, 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 you know, and many of us, or many of you, I don't watch the news, okay? But many of you have different news sources and many more things that all formed our belief systems or our outlook on life. All these different components that you see here, they all formed the foundation of our perception filters. Perception filters is how we perceive life. How we see life was influenced by all the various factors that came across our paths as we were growing up. You know, two people can look at the same situation and see two entirely different things and understand them completely differently and both people think that their view is the right one and they will fight to the death to protect, protect that view, right? Because, you know, like Proverbs said, every way of man is right in his own eyes. And I suppose this is more glaringly visible in politics today than probably any other aspect of life. But never has the world been more out of joint than it is today. You know, the last 30 to 40 years of government-controlled schools has produced the most insane ideologies to ever have been foisted on mankind. You know, in this list here, right, I got teachers right here. Teachers, right? And teachers also represent education. And for the most part, you and I did not receive the same education as the children of the last 30, 40 years. What they learned formed a belief system and a perception filter that is totally unrecognizable by you and me, okay? You hear a lot about mental illness today, right? And most of us can see that the mental illness that is present in this world was taught, not inherited, okay? It's not a psychological illness. It's not, it's not that. It is a taught mental illness. You know, the things that we see younger generations doing, I consider it to be mental illness, right? <laughs> so this belief system and perception filter that everyone has drives man's assumptions about what they see or hear. Now, assumptions are not facts. An assumption is what you, based on many factors, think something is. You, you know what, what, what they say about assuming, right? When you assume, they say you make an ass of you and me. I'd like to change that and say that when you assume, you make an ass of yourself. I see through your assumptions, personally, okay? And these assumptions will drive behavior. And, you know, have you ever seen behavior among young people today as deplorable as it is, as it's ever been? I mean, have you ever seen so much disrespect and anger and vulgarity and a contrary way of looking at life I mean, I certainly never have, but this is how ideologies are formed. This is how religious ideologies, you know, man's view of God and how he is and what he's capable of doing. There are many factors involved in how people perceive life. 
and it's, it's different for everyone. Folks, this is why the salvation of all is absolutely necessary because the whole human race is totally screwed up. This is why we need the salvation of all. If there is no salvation of all, everybody's going to hell. If there was such a place, right? There isn't, but if that was the alternative, then every, you know, like 99% are going to hell, okay? Now, according, according to popular theologians and popular pastors that we all personally know, you know, God is presented as the monster that will torment his own created beings and burn and torture them without end forever. Now, if that was true, it's not true. But if that was true, if there was a memory wipe, imagine not knowing why you're being tormented. Imagine that. <laughs> On the other hand, think about this. In John chapter 20 and verse 27, there are marks in the hands and the side of the Lord Jesus Christ. But a memory wipe will render those useless. We wouldn't even remember by who or how mankind was redeemed. That would be a shame, wouldn't it? So, I want to take a deeper look at will we recognize each other in eternity? And I want you to think about this, okay? The word family is found 123 times in the Bible. The plural of it, families, is found 174 times. That's a total of 297 mentions of families. That's almost 300 mentions of families in the Word of God. So you can be absolutely certain that God is interested in families. God created families. God will keep families together. So it's obvious that the world we live in, especially those in authority, want to destroy the family unit. The, the attacks against two-parent homes is a vicious, diabolical, satanic attack. It's not only an attack against families, it's a personal attack against God. But part of the reconciliation of all will be the reconciliation of families. You can rest assured of that. Okay? The first thing that God created after Adam and Eve was the family. You know, the law of first mention is the law that the way God first created something is the way that it will end up in the end. Many things may come in between the first thing that is mentioned in the Bible about family, many things will come in the Bible, many come, things will come through time to disrupt that and destroy that, but ultimately the end result will be what God intended at the first. The family unit will be restored to everyone. Okay? A matter of fact, one of the first promises in the Bible has to do with families. You remember this, Genesis 12, 2 and 3, and I will make of thee, this is the promise to Abraham, I will make of thee a great nation and I will bless thee and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. This verse does not say that all families of the earth shall have a memory wipe. That is not what this verse is talking about, okay? Let's look at something that happened to a family in the Bible and what God had to say about this family and what God had to say about the situation, right? Now, if you remember 2 Samuel chapter 12, 
David's child gets very sick. And David pleads with God to save his life. So David fasts all night. And David is lying on the earth. And the elders of the house tried to raise David from the earth. And he would not. And he didn't want to eat. And he was, you know, he was discouraged and afraid. But on the seventh day, his child died. And his servants were afraid to tell him because when the child was still alive, they refused to listen to his servants. But now the child is dead. So David says this. He said, while the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead. Wherefore, why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? Listen, I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. Now, if this had happened to any other person living at any time in history, could the same thing have been said of them? In other words, you have a child that dies. Could you say, I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me? In other words, he's not coming back from the dead. But when I die, I shall go to him. You know how else this could be phrased? My mother died. I shall go to her but she shall not return to me. Or we could all say, every one of us, you know, my brother or my sister or my father or my grandparents or my own children died. I shall go to him or her, but he or her shall not return to me. You see, the last words of verse 23 have a universal application to all of Adam's fallen children, bar none. I mean, this is as good a promise that we will know each other in eternity as anything you can find in the Bible. David looked forward to the reunion with his son just as much as my grandmother, when she lost one of her sons and mourned his passing, she looked forward to her reunion with her son. You know, I shared the story a long time ago that, you know, my grandmother, when she was dying, she was now at the hospital with only a day or two to go. I got a call from my mother and my, it was like eight or nine in the morning and my mother said, honey, if you want to see Meme again, you're going to have to come right now. And I remember, like, wow. I got in my car, and by 4 o'clock, it's a nine-hour drive, by 4 o'clock, I was at the hospital. And I walked into that hospital, and all, all the relatives were there. Now, you're talking three, 400 people, okay? My, my grandmother had 17 children, okay? Something like that. A couple, a couple of them, I think, didn't make it. But, but it, and, and of course, now you've got all the, the grandkids and the, the, like the, you know, the, the great-grandkids and everybody. That, I mean, there's, it, there's people coming out of the room into the hallway, okay? There's so many people there. And my mother had told them, Rodney's coming from Connecticut. So I remember walking and seeing all those people. And as I'm walking, you know, it was, like, it was like Moses, the Red Sea was parting, right? And they were, they were letting me in. And the whole thing parted all the way to my grandmother's bed. And uh, I'll never forget, I'll never forget, reaching my grandmother and when she saw me. I mean, the glow on her face. And I reached down and hugged her and kissed her on the cheek and I was hugging her 
and she whispered in my ear, I'll see you in heaven. And I said, yeah, mammy, I'll see you in heaven. And we were both crying now. Now we're both crying. The idea that that could not be possible because of a memory wipe is the most ridiculous thing that I could ever think of in my entire life. See? And so, <laughs> anyway, I'm going to keep going, okay? But, again, the truth found in those last words of that, sent, of that verse 23 are a universal truth that applies to all the families of the earth and is certainly not isola an isolated truth for David alone. This was a fact that he knew, that everyone who was listening to him knew. It's a fact that you know just by virtue of the fact that family, family is everything. You know, at the holidays, the airports are packed all over the world with people going to spend the week or a few days with what? Family. Family was God's idea, not man's idea. Family is the most important thing that we all have. I understand there are families now with different views. People don't even want to talk to each other, but that's irrelevant. Family is still the most important truth that there is in this world. There is nothing like family. And I'm blessed. I'm blessed to have, you know, an older sister and a younger brother and a younger sister. And we are one. We all love each other. We did not let our parents decease ruin our friendship by being greedy about who was going to get what. Okay, we had agreed years before anything happened that we were just going to split everything four ways and maintain our love for each other. And that's what happened. And today, we have the greatest family that you could possibly imagine. My siblings and myself, we just... We love each other to death. Okay, we love each other, as they say, to the moon and back. <laughs> okay, that's, that's one of the sayings in our family. But family is everything. Now, here's another interesting narrative from the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew chapter 17. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with them. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, one for Elias, Elias which is Elijah. So, in verse 3, Moses and Elijah are speaking with Jesus Christ. He knew who they were, and they obviously knew who he was. I mean, they had been dead for some 2,500 years. I didn't calculate this time frame, but about that, right? In verse 4, Peter says, let's make three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, one for Elias. So obviously, there was no memory wipe for them. There was a recognition of each other, even after all that time. Now, think about what Peter wrote in 2 Peter. And don't forget that Peter is writing to those, excuse me, he's writing to those who had been, had been scattered. In 2 Peter chapter 1, 
For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly in the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them, and be established in the present truth. Yea, I think it meet, as long as I am in this tabernacle, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me, Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able, after my decease, to have these things always in remembrance. So, they will have these things always in remembrance, but Peter's going to have a memory wipe. Now, that doesn't sound right, does it? Because Peter... And the twelve will be setting on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel throughout the, the thousand-year millennial reign of, of Jesus Christ. So we're supposed to believe that for a thousand years they remember everything and then going into eternity they experience this memory wipe and forget every person that they ever knew their wives, their families, and everything. Does that make sense to you? I mean, logically, common sense thinking, does that even make sense to you? And then think of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, okay? Now, we have new people on today, I know that for a fact, but I'm just going to take a minute to explain this timeline, okay? But this whole timeline from Genesis to Malachi right here had to do with the circumcision, Israel, and the uncircumcision, those which belonged to Israel who were not circumcised, who had been scattered among the nations and had assimilated into their cultures and that's what the middle wall of partition was between the Hebrew, Jew, Israel, whatever you want to call them, was between those who were circumcised and those who were uncircumcised. That's, the middle wall of partition was not between Israel and the heathen nations. That's what's commonly taught about this. That's not at all. This is a Jewish book. It's about them, not about you and me, although we're mentioned throughout. It's still not about us. We are the recipients of the blessing that will come upon them. We're the, we're the families of the earth that will be blessed through all of them. Okay? But then you see John the Baptist. He breaks the 400 years of silence and he introduces Jesus Christ and he says to them, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And it was at hand, but they rejected their Messiah. They rejected their kingdom and they crucified him. On the cross, he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Until the fall of Israel, there is a one year period where God is trying to get Israel to repent and bring them to their senses but they don't. So here he raises up this man called Saul of Tarsus who became the Apostle Paul. And he gave him the revelation of a secret which is that these two groups of people here would be united together in one body here. That's who's in that body. Okay, And then today we live in a age that's, that Paul called in Romans chapter 5 the, that where grace reigns. Today we're living in the reign of grace. Unmerited favor. That all people experience that. The whole world experiences that. There's a time coming and maybe we're even living in it now. The time of Jacob's trouble. Okay, Daniel's 70th week. 
No one really understands what that is to, to completion. This is why I don't preach prophecy or talk about it. But then the next event to take place is right here. It's the second coming. The second coming of Jesus Christ takes place right here at the beginning of the millennial kingdom. Now this is the whole timeline of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. The, the kingdom of heaven is the literal, visible, physical, Davidic kingdom of Jesus Christ reigning on the earth for a thousand years. That happens after his second coming. The second coming is the next event that's going to take place in the history of mankind. That's the next event, okay? Now, in this kingdom, we read in Matthew 8, 11, and I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. This is the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven, which is according to the denominations of the world going to heaven up there. That's not what it is. The kingdom of heaven is on the earth. It's on the earth. Okay? And since Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob will be in that kingdom, that means that a resurrection takes place at the second coming of Jesus Christ. Okay? Now, obviously, in that kingdom, everyone will know themselves because these people, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, are identified as being present there. And a very important point to consider at this juncture is when does this supposed memory wipe take place? I mean, in the kingdom, people will know themselves. You know, as, as is an obvious fact, because Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are going to be there, and many will come from the east and, the west and sit down with them, and they're going to know them, okay? So another verse that has Israel in mind is 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. Obviously, this is Israel. These are people, these are not non-Jews. They belong to the family of God, Okay? It doth not yet appear what we shall be, what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, his second coming, we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So at the appearing of Jesus Christ, all those who participate in this resurrection, and again, in this verse, John is speaking exclusively to them. He's not speaking to you and me. So at his second coming, they will be, notice that we shall be like him. They will be like Jesus Christ. So how will Jesus Christ be at his second coming? Well, he's coming, he's returning with his resurrected, glorified body. So in that resurrection, they also get their glorified bodies. So they will all know each other, okay? Now, a lot of people have a hard time. Well, you mean there's going to be people with glorified bodies on the earth and people without glorified bodies on the earth? Yes. Yeah. But it's not a big deal for God. What makes you think that your glorified body is going to look different than what this looks like now? Except that it's got eternity em embedded into the DNA. That's what the glorified body is. And there may be some distinctions, but it's not a problem for God. And it's not going to be a problem for anybody that is in that kingdom. Glorified body or not. Okay, because there is death. In that kingdom right there is death okay so here's the point this so-called man-made memory wipe is not during 
the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. Okay, now think about this. According to that teaching, we're supposed to believe that the memory wipe will take place at the end of the millennium, right before eternity begins, so that in eternity, no one will know anyone. I mean, does that even make sense to you? Does that even make sense? <laughs> no, it doesn't make sense, right? I mean, think of the blessings that take place during the thousand year reign of Christ. Like for example, Numbers 14, 21, but as truly as I live, all the earth, now that's in the millennium, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord, all of it. Habakkuk 2, 14, for the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Isaiah 11, 9, they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Jeremiah 31, 34, and they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Okay, so according to these verses, everyone is going to know the Lord. But also, who's going to remember what? Notice, it's the Lord who will remember their sin no more. The memory wipe is on God's side, not man's side. That's the only thing that makes sense because Jesus Christ took away the sin of the world. He put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. I mean, what's there to remember? God's certainly not going to remember that sin anymore. And think of this, Isaiah 25, 8, he will swallow up death in victory. He will swallow up death in victory. And the Lord God will wipe away all tears from off all faces. And the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off all the earth. For the Lord hath spoken it. This is a beautiful truth. This is a beautiful truth that is confirmed here. Okay, right here, Revelation 21, 4. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes and there shall be no more death neither sorrow nor crying neither there shall there be any more pain for the former things are passed away rather than a memory wipe God will wipe away all tears from off all faces I mean you want to talk about wiping something away what would be the point of a memory wipe what would that, the point of that be after God wipes away all tears? Imagine all tears being wiped away and then there's a memory wipe and now you don't even remember why the tears are wiped away or who wiped them away. I mean, the entire concept of a memory wipe, especially a memory wipe that is built upon the false applications of a few verses of Scripture, is one that is very discouraging. You know, in the family of the children of men, if there is one thing that is dear and holds the greatest hope for us, it's the hope of being reunited with our families and for us, for, for me, for my family especially, we're looking for the day where we'll be reunited with our mothers. Okay, that is a universal desire that I believe we all hold. And then there's this verse which directly applies to every one of us which, that are watching today. Isaiah 26, verse 8 and 9. Yea, in the way of thy judgments, which are corrections in the word of God, 
O Lord, in the way of thy corrections, O Lord, have we waited for thee? The desire of our soul is to thy name and to the remembrance of thee. Now, this takes place in the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, okay? Notice verse 9, with my soul have I desired thee in the night. Yea, with my spirit within me will I seek thee. Notice, for when thy corrections... That's what judgments are. They're correction. This is when God is making things right. For when thou art making things right in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. So for a thousand years, the inhabitants of the earth learn righteousness. But according to the wipeout theory, at the end of the thousand years, all that thing, everything that they've learned will be wiped out. Does that make any sense to you? Now let me close with this today. At the beginning of our time together today, I showed you verses that were misunderstood and that the memory wipe, where the memory wipe doctrine had come from. When I first heard about the memory wipe, you know, I ask myself this question. What kind of person would see something so heartless, so discouraging, so hopeless as a memory wipe from God? You know, oh, sorry. When we looked at this a while ago, you know, we can see many places that the human machine could develop a glitch, right? For example, suppose that one's life with his family was filled with strife and anger and rejection. And suppose that that filtered into his relationships with his friends and teachers. And in his mind, Nothing in this life was right. Nothing works right, right? Uh, and of course, you know, there's a sense in which we can all fall into that category. All of us have had situations that are affected by all these components, right? So it would be easy to think that a memory wipe would be a great solution. You know, if you fall in that category of, you know, where you were always the victim, right? But listen to this, folks. Reconciliation will fix all of us. Reconciliation means to restore to the original state of being. The way Adam was in the garden before he fell is where every single human being ever born is headed. That's your destination in the future. You know, I look at my past, for example. You know, after my father died, four years later, my mother remarried. And I think everyone knows that the relationship I had with my stepdad was rocky, to say the least. But I always had my mother there as the softest, gentlest, kindest person I have ever known. She brought comfort in the midst of the storm that was in the relationship between my, my stepfather and myself. Well, a few months after I understood that Jesus Christ had died to save me, you know, at that point in January of 1984, I didn't realize he died to save the whole world, whether they like it or not. But after that, that encounter, I wrote my stepdad a long letter acknowledging that I had been the cause of our fights. And I asked him to forgive me, which he did. And I remember going up to Maine, I had not been there in years. I remember flying up there and getting off the plane and they picked me up at the, at the Presque Isle airport. And, you know, we hugged my stepfather and me. We hugged for the first time in my life. And we drove to our 
camp on the lake. And he sat me down at, a, at the table there. And he asked me to forgive him for not having come to my baseball games and not having come to my hockey games and not having been the dad that he was supposed to do. And we had a full circle reconciliation and forgiveness on both sides of the table, okay? And so that part of my life which I had always blamed on him, but in reality was mostly my fault, and of course his negligence, but that part of my life was fixed. And the peace that came from that was just overwhelming. And I'm convinced today, and I'm assured by scripture, that seeking forgiveness is the cure and the remedy for all the relationships of our past, every one of us, every one of you listening right now, forgiveness and seeking forgiveness is the secret to having the full and complete peace of God, okay? Now, someone might say, but you don't know what they did to me. Well, I can imagine what they did. But seeking reconciliation is the remedy for that problem. I know some, some of you have, some, some people have said, maybe none of you listening, but I'll never talk to that person again. I don't want them coming near, and I understand that. I understand that. And if you can't go near them, you need to forgive them yourself just to free yourself from that past. I honestly believe that if everyone sought reconciliation with their past, that they would look forward to being reunited, even with those people they believe were in the wrong. I mean, let's face it, folks. It takes two people to create a, a good relationship or a bad relationship. And I realize that some people didn't cause some of the hurt that they have in their own lives now. I mean, they were really taken advantage of. They really were. I understand that. But God has forgiven that person who caused you that harm. God has forgiven. Jesus Christ took away the sin of the world. Jesus Christ fixed all of that. You know? And as we've been forgiven, we, that's how we also forgive. Amen? You know, like the example I just gave you of, my, of me and my stepdad. So according to what we've looked at in the Bible today, I am, I'm totally convinced, I'm 100% card-carrying convinced that the memory wipe theory is totally false and that a great reunion with our families and long-lost loved ones will be the most beautiful thing that has ever happened to any of us, okay? This world that we're going through is the place where a contrast is being created, a bad contrast, so that in the next life, the contrast of this life with that one will be so glaringly obvious that the appreciation for the new place will be even greater, that if we had not experienced everything we're experiencing now, none of that would make any sense, okay? And not only that, don't forget, there won't be any sin natures on the other side of this thing. No one will look at someone who hurt them with anger or animosity or, God forbid, unforgiveness. Total reconciliation of all things will include the total reconciliation of all pain and all problems and all discouragements and all hatred and all bad relationships that existed between individuals. If it wasn't like that, then it would not be reconciliation. Reconcili the reconciliation of all means restoring everything back to the original state of being the way it was before man ever fell, before man ever sinned against God, before man ever rebelled. 
in that day when there was no sin, there was perfect peace in that garden. What a place that must have been. <laughs> That's where we're going. That's where we're all headed. That will be the most glorious day of all your existence. And that day will last for eternity. For all eternity. This life is temporary. Right? What is this life but a vapor? You walk out on a cold morning, it's there and it's gone. Your life is like the time an arrow leaves the bow to the target. It's the stay of the mailman at your door. This life is short. This life is transient, temporary, and was designed by God to create this horrible contrast. As bad as it is, as painful as it is, my back is still killing me, by the way. <laughs> it still even hurts to laugh. I did, I did a good one here, okay? But as bad as this everything is, and, the, and for some people, it's worse than others. Those who've had things happen to them that are unmentionable. Children taken from them. And only God knows, right? For them, it will be even greater if that is possible. <laughs> if that were possible, it will be greater. The reconciliation will be will transcend and the joy and the joy that will be present there in that day. Wow. To take that away from believers today and introduce a memory wipe, I don't understand that kind of thinking there's a you know I, I, I don't want to I don't want to cast aspersions upon that but there's no memory wipe folks there's a full knowledge now will we remember all the th even if we did it would be irrelevant only because you don't have a sin nature your brain's not going to go there you have a whole new thing you're focusing on. I have cousins who've gone before me. I have one, his name's Rosaire, like Rosario, like Rosario de Perry, uh, de Perio, Rosaire de Perio. <laughs> his name was Rosaire, Rosaire. I look forward to seeing him again. He was like early 20s when he was taken in a car accident. And I look forward to that. I look forward to seeing my father who died when I was four years old. I look forward to seeing my stepfather. You know, people say, well, what about people who were married? Isn't that gonna be like a controversy up there? Of course not. Of course not. There's no marriage going on up there. Everybody, there's no sin nature. There'll be no jealousy, no animosity. There'll be nothing like that. You know? So, you think about it, folks. A memory wipe or where we're going. I'm going with where we're going. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's, let's close with a word of prayer. Lord, I'm thankful that we can look at verses in the Bible, understand them, and then see things like, I will go to him, but he shall not return to me. What a beautiful truth that is, that we can all rely on and 
we can place our anchor there and rejoice in those truths because the death, burial, and resurrection really did fix everything and everyone. Thank you for these that have joined us, Lord. I pray that the words of this message today will be forged upon the tablets of their hearts and they'll walk away rejoicing at what's to come, not what is right now. I pray for their peace. I pray that they stop filling their brains with all the negative things that are coming out of the news these days and just be at peace with themselves and be at peace knowing the salvation of all. I pray these things in that name that is above every name, the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.